As Phil said, my name is Juan. I'm the student pastor, uh, and I gotta be honest with you. I'll make I'll make a, a little bit of a of an honest thing here. Is I'm kind of used to by now of Phil giving me the hard topics to preach on. If I'm being honest, like typically he's like, "Hey, your first sermon it was about making sure that people are excited about church and see church as something they get to do, not have to do." And then after that, a couple weeks ago, I had to start our money series and tell people how to manage their money. As a 30 year old, you're probably looking at me like, "What do you know about money? Not much." but the Bible knows. Um, and then this series came up and I was like, oh man, he is for sure going to stick me with the sex topic, but he didn't. And David got to head that one off last week. Um, and we're super grateful um, how that went. And I was asked um, after service last week, did David draw the short straw? Is that why he got the sex talk? And I was like, no, Phil just decided that it was, it was his turn to get a little red up here. So we're thankful for David um, for handing that. So I get to pick up where he left off um, in the Song of Songs. Solomon, which, by the way, we had a conversation this week, and we decided that if any of you have a baby in nine months, that's how we'll know that the sermon on sex landed in our audience, okay? So just as a heads up, we will be looking out for kids in nine months. Um, but we're going to jump into what comes after that chapter on sex in the Song of Solomon, and we're going to be talking about conflict. Conflict, 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 and what that looks like in our lives. Ecclesiastes 4.9 says this, Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. And I would add to that that not only is two better than one, two is also harder than one if you really think about it. Especially when it comes to your relationships, when you go from living for one to living for two people. Um, uh, a few years back, I was, uh, Elke and I had just gotten engaged and I got um, the opportunity to move off campus while I was in college, and I moved in with one of my best friends. Long story short, total bachelor pad, not a nice looking house, but it was, it was his house. Um, and I moved in, I was paying $100 for rent, and it was like your typical bachelor pad. Like they were, they were, the, the couch was dirty, nothing was ever clean. Our TV was like on a coffee table that was way too low because we didn't have an entertainment center. The kitchen was a mess, but it was ours. And it was, a, it was just the two of us, and it was awesome because we'd stay up late playing video games and watching movies and didn't really care about anybody else other than the two of us, uh, him and I, and we're both technically leave, living for one because we wouldn't really see each other much. And I remember uh, a few months go by and I saw this recipe on Facebook of a, of a dish I wanted to make and I sent it to Elke because we're engaged at the time and I'm like, hey, you know what would be really fun is if we cook together. Um, you know, we can, and she's like, yeah, yeah, pick me up, we'll go to Walmart, get all the ingredients, we'll go to the house and we'll make this meal together. And I'm like, that sounds great. So I go and I pick her up and we go to Walmart, get everything, come back home and we are getting ready to start cooking, and we're getting everything prepped, and she goes and opens the microwave. Now, when I say, like, this microwave was dirty, I'm not talking about, like, your kid, your kid heats up some chicken noodle soup and it spills over. I'm talking, we hadn't cleaned this sucker the entire time I had been living there. You couldn't see the white on the inside of the microwave because everything had exploded and caked on so thick. Like the, the glass dish thing that spins didn't actually spin anymore because it was all gunked up. And Elke opens this thing and she's like, I'm not cooking in that. That has to be clean. To me, I was like, yeah, it's dirty, but it still heats up things. You know, like it still serves its purpose. And she was like, no, 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 we're cleaning this. So she spent the next several hours cleaning up the microwave before we'd even start cooking with it. And at the end of it all, she was like, you might as well just throw that thing away and buy a new microwave because there's no saving that thing. But that's what living for one was like. I, I didn't really notice the things that didn't really matter to me. But then I got married and I started living for two. And when you start living for two, you start having um, certain discussions and arguments and conflict about how you're going to do things. Things like money. How are you going to spend your money? How are you going to spend your free time? Are you going to squeeze the toothpaste roll or are you going to roll it like a psychopath? How are you going to put the toilet paper? Are you going to go flap up or flap down? One of them looks like a mullet. One of them looks like a beard. One of them is better than the other. Um, how are you going to spend your holidays? Where are your, you know, what are you going to do with the kids? So many things come into dynamics when it's two of you, and it just creates conflict. And in every relationship, there are four stages, okay? Here are the four stages of relationship. Attraction, infatuation, passion, accommodation. Real quick, attraction. This is where you see that person. You see that someone, and you are immediately attracted to them. They're beautiful. They're handsome. You want to get to know them. You want to get to know this person and spend some time with this person. I, for me, 
I was down at the creek at Ozark Christian College. Elkie was walking down. She was going to do her homework at the creek. I saw her. She was definitely checking me out first. And I was attracted to her, and I wanted to go get to know her. Um, so that's attraction. After attraction comes infatuation. Infatuation is the part where that other person in your eyes cannot do anything wrong. They are, the, the ground they walk on is holy. Like daisies sprout up behind them every step that they take. And they can do no wrongs in your life. All of their annoying habits are not annoying to you. They're just charming. It's beautiful. It's amazing. They are like next to Jesus, the holiest thing on planet earth. And then comes passion. Passion is typically where you start taking the relationship to the next level. You start getting deeper. Here's where people usually get married, and you start seeking that deeper emotional uh, connection, physical relationship, um, and it keeps getting deeper and deeper after that. And then comes accommodation. Now, accommodation is when the honeymoon period is over. So if any of you are in the passion stage, congratulations. Accommodation is really close by. Um, and accommodation is where life just kind of goes back to normal. It, it, everything goes back to normal. Everything slows down. You're not in the honeymoon stage anymore. And you start noticing those little habits in that other person that in the infatuation stage, they were so harmless. But now they're kind of annoying. And they're kind of, you know, they kind of rattle you a little bit. Like maybe, why is he always yelling at the TV? The quarterback can't hear him. Or, or maybe why is she leaving the dishes all crusty and gross next to the sink? Why doesn't she put them in the sink and put water in them? Or why does he always leave his underwear and his socks next to the dirty clothes hamper? Is it that hard to just put them in the hamper? I'm always picking up after him. Or why is she always taking my car and leaving it on empty when she parks it in the garage? And then I have to fill up the car the next morning. All these little things, all these little habits that sometimes become a bigger deal... And you can put up with it for a little while, but after some time, it starts conflict. And when conflict starts, you have two options. You can either fight to win, or you can fight fair to save the relationship. Here's something I want to start you off with is this. Healthy couples are not defined by their lack of conflict. They are defined by their ability to fight through those conflicts in a fair way. If you ever meet a couple and they're like, oh, yeah, we never fight, they are lying to you or they're delusional. Everybody has conflict, but how healthy is your relationship depends on how you handle that conflict. And working through conflict as Christians is extremely important, especially in a married type of relationship, because as Christians, we view marriage as a covenant. We don't view marriage as a contract. The world views marriage as a contract. As Christians, we view it as a covenant. And it is something that is important to us, but the world says, hey, just get out of it when it gets tough. As soon as you're done with it, as soon as there's a slightest inconvenience, just get on out of there. Billy Graham's wife was asked um, a, few, uh, a couple years back about if she ever thought about throwing in the towel on their marriage. You know, Billy Graham used to travel the country, used to do all these uh, revivals and crusades, and she spent a lot, of time of, uh, a lot of time alone. They had some conflict, and she was asked, hey, did you ever consider divorce? Did you ever think about it? And this, was what, this is what she said. She said, divorce, no. Murder, Yes. <laughs> So Billy Graham's wife herself, she said, I would never divorce my husband, but I can't say that I haven't thought about killing him. Um, here's a quick disclaimer. My goal with this sermon is not to shame you if divorce is part of your story, if, if that's the decision that you've made in the past. But my hope, though, is that through this, you would encounter the forgiveness and the grace that is easily afforded to every single one of us through Jesus Christ. And then if you did remarry, I want to encourage you in the stage of life that you are in on how to defend and how to protect your marriage in this season. Also, if you're single and you've tuned me out because I'm talking about marriage, I want to say something to you real quick. All of the things that we're going to go through, yes, it's about marriage, but all of them can be applied to different types of relationships, not just marriage relationships. So to preserve the marriage, we have to learn to walk through conflict. So let's see what Solomon has to say about conflict. Chapter 5, verses 2 through 3 say this. I slept, but my heart was awake, a sound. My beloved is knocking. Open to me, my sister, my love, my dove, my perfect one. For my head is wet with dew, my locks with the drops of the night. I had put off my garment. How could I put it on? I had bathed my feet. How could I soil them? So we see here that Solomon's wife is 
she's, she's asleep, but her mind is awake for some reason. Her mind is racing for some reason. And for some reason, they're also in separate rooms, whether he was out doing something or some scholars believe they actually slept in separate bed chambers. That's not a huge ordeal, but, but he comes to her and he's knocking on the door of her room and he's sweet talking her. He's like, baby, hello, are you awake? What are you doing? Oh my gosh, you're so pretty. Your cooking is so much better than my mom's cooking. You keep the house nice and clean. Like you're the best. And he's just trying to like earn some brownie points so that he can cash in later. He's trying to have sex with his wife. And he's trying to wake her up and he's trying to like get, get her in the mood. And she hits him with this one. She's like, I already took off my nightgown though. And I'm in bed. Or I, I already showered. I don't, you know, I don't want to get my feet dirty. Fellas, this is the modern day equivalent of your wife hitting you with that. Maybe not tonight. I have a headache. That's exactly what she's doing right here. And she's not, she's not interested in, his, in, in what he's wanting to do. And she also seems to come across a little bit as annoyed in this moment. So our first takeaway is this. Conflict often arises when you're angry or annoyed. These are the times where conflict usually comes up. So let's see how Solomon reacts. Now remember, this is right after the honeymoon period. So everything was going great, and now we're running into this. So this is how Solomon reacts. It says, My beloved put his hand on the latch, and my heart was thrilled within me. I arose to open to my beloved, and my hands dripped with myrrh, my fingers with liquid myrrh, on the handles of the bolt. I opened to my beloved, but my beloved had turned and gone. My soul failed me when he, when he spoke. I sought out to him, but found him not. I called him, but he gave me no answer. So for some reason, she's had this change of heart. She realizes that, that this isn't right, and she's going to go after him. She opens the door, and he's gone at this point. He's no longer there. Now, a couple things I want you to notice. In verse 5, it talks about her hands dripping with myrrh. And so what we can um, discern from this is that he actually took some flowers, and before he left, he left them on the door handle for her. And if you've read the, the other chapters, you realize that myrrh has been a really big symbol in their story so far. And the reason he does this is that he's reminding her of their love. They're in this conflict. They're in a fight. She's not really wanting to deal with him right now. So he leaves flowers as a reminder to her of their love. Uh, I remember when I got engaged, one of my RAs told me this. He said, hey, when you get mad at her, because it will happen, when conflict arises, remember why you fell in love with her. Remember why you fell in love with her in the first place when conflict comes up. And one thing I often do is I, whenever we're having a spat or disagreement and I, and I have some time to myself, I'll actually listen to the song that Elkie and I had our first dance to. And that just kind of reminds me again of, of where our love started and how far we've come since then. And it, and it helps in those moments. Also, another thing to notice is in verse 6 is that Solomon actually removes himself from the situation. He doesn't stay there. We don't see Solomon banging on the door, yelling, ripping the door open, getting angry, which, by the way, mind you, he could have done any of those things, and it would have been okay, because he is the king, and he gets to do whatever he wants, but he doesn't. He leaves some flowers on the door, and he walks away from the conflict, and she realizes quickly in this moment that she has sinned, so that leads us to takeaway number two, and that is this. Sometimes the best thing you can do for resolving conflict is to remove yourself from the situation. Sometimes you have to remove yourself from the situation in order to resolve conflict. And here's a couple ways to know if you should remove yourself from the situation in these moments. If you start raising your voice to your spouse, that's a good time to remove yourself. If you start verbally attacking each other, if you have children and they seem nervous or scared in the moment, if you're getting closer to being physically aggressive, you feel like, you just want to take your anger out on something, you're starting to tense up, those are moments to walk away. Now, this isn't an, walking away is not an excuse to never solve the problem because our goal as believers is always reconciliation, but it is okay to walk away, put some distance for a moment, cool down, and then come back and readdress it at some point. And the issue here is that many times people don't understand when they should walk away. And that's when we run into scenarios of abuse. And even here at the church, whenever we have people that come to us with, with these issues, we will tell them, hey, you need some distance. You need to separate right now, and you need to seek some counseling. And there's nothing wrong with that with walking away with the goal of maybe reconciling down the road. 
So we see Solomon here, and he removes himself from the, from the situation. She realizes that she did something wrong, so now she's chasing after him. She opens the door. He's not there. She's running out the door into the city to look for him, and this is what happens. The watchmen found me as they went about in the city. They beat me. They bruised me. They took away my veil, those watchmen of the walls. I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, if you find my beloved, that you tell him I am sick with love. So she's talking to her friends. The daughters of Jerusalem are her community, her girlfriends, her, her crew. And she's saying, hey, if you find him, would you tell me where he's at? I'm looking for him. And then the daughters of Jerusalem reply in this way to her. What is your beloved more than another beloved? O most beautiful among women. What is your beloved more than another beloved that you thus adjure us? Now, this whole section is about airing out your dirty laundry in public. I can't imagine that many of you want to go home right now, grab your dirty clothes hamper, and dump it on the stage for everybody to look at it. But that's often what we do whenever there is conflict. And in verse 7, we see that she is found by these watchmen, and they beat her, and they take her away. Now, some scholars believe that this is symbolism, that she wasn't actually beat, and that this is actually a symbol to God convicting her of her sin in that moment. And then others believe that she was actually confused by the only woman that would be out and about at this time of the night, which would be a prostitute. It would be a woman of the night. And this is, again, symbolism to them misunderstanding who she is, the way that people misunderstand us when we air our grievances against one another publicly. Now, for here, you can gather, we can gather that we need to be careful how much we air publicly. How do you talk about your spouse in public? Because there's a difference between teasing one another and just trying to be mean and hurtful to one another. Because teasing, it can be okay to a point, but, but, but hurtfulness is not. That's, that's being a Christian 101. Hurting one another, seeking to hurt one another with our words is not what we are called to do. And it can cause questions in people if you're constantly bad-mouthing your spouse, people will start to wonder, if this is how he, if this is how she talks about their spouse, the person that they're supposed to love the most, how are they talking about me when I'm not around? Ephesians 4.29 says this, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Now we're going to fast forward to the next part of, of that section we just read where she's talking to the daughters of Jerusalem. And we see her talking to them, and, and they start asking him, or they start asking her, who is this guy? They're actually being a little bit sarcastic here, and they're saying like, Hey, who, who is he? Who, who is this guy? Why is he important? Why are you, why are you even bothering with him? Why, do not, why don't you just break up with him? Why don't you just leave him and just be done with him? It sounds like this is a lot of trouble. So why are we going through this trouble to find him? Get rid of him. And from this, we can learn that we have to be careful who we confide in. You have to be careful who you bring into the conflict, especially in your marriage. Now, yes, you absolutely need people to talk to. You need it. We were meant to be living life in community. You need people to bounce ideas off of. But that advice has to come from a trustworthy and wise source. It has to come from somebody that you should be listening to. Your marriage advice probably shouldn't come from your drinking buddy that's on his fourth marriage because he, he cheated on the last three, okay? That's not the best place to find marriage advice. It needs to come from a wise source. Proverbs 24, 6 says this, For by wise guidance you can wage your war, and in abundance of counselors there is victory. So we see that we are supposed to have counselors, but takeaway number three, you need to watch your mouth and you need to watch your counsel. Watch your mouth, watch how you speak about one another, and watch the people that you allow to speak into your life. Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verses 10 through 16. Now she's going to start talking about who her husband is to her friends that are questioning this man. This is what she says. My beloved is radiant and ruddy, distinguished among 10,000. His head is the finest gold. His locks are wavy, black as a raven. His eyes are like doves beside streams of water, bathed in milk, sitting beside a full pool. His cheeks are like beds of spices, mounds of sweet-smelling herbs. His lips are lilies, dripping with liquid myrrh. His arms are rods of gold set with jewels. His body is polished ivory bedecked with sapphires. His legs are alabaster columns 
Don't skip leg day right here in the Bible. His legs are alabaster columns set on bases of gold. His appearance is like Lebanon, choices as the cedars. His mouth is most sweet, and he is altogether desirable. This is my beloved. This is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. So we see here that she's clearing her husband's name to, to her friends. She's saying, hey, this is my husband. This is, this is the man I love. This is the man that I'm looking for. In verse 11, she's talking about how his head is the finest of golds, and it, and it can be a symbol to his wisdom. In verse 16, his mouth is most sweet. That means that he speaks uplifting words to her. He's sweet to her. He, he watches the way he speaks to her. But the most important part that I want us to see here is at the end of verse 16. He sa- she says, This is my beloved and this is my friend. My friend is the part I want to focus on here. A healthy marriage to avoid as much conflict as possible has to be rooted in friendship. It has to be rooted in a deep friendship. Now, I'm not saying that people that date for three months and then get married are not going to work out. Trust me, I've seen a thousand of those in Bible college. It happens every other weekend. But, But here's the thing. A healthy marriage for the majority has to start with a deep Friendship. Your spouse should be your best friend, the person that you confide in the most. Look back to when you were dating. You used to do everything together, and everything was enjoyable, even the boring things. Like, Elkie and I used to go sit in the library and not do homework with her. That sounds awful right now. I want to pull my teeth out. But with my best friend, it was, it was doable. And now all these things that you used to do that were so enjoyable that you would do with a best friend, they should be enjoyable to do with your spouse because your spouse should be your best friend. Now, I'm a youth pastor. I work with teenagers. I'm going to talk to parents of teens real quick for just a second. Marriage should be rooted in deep friendship, right? That is why I think that if you have a teenager, you should, they should delay dating as long as possible. Here's the thing. If they can't drive themselves to the movies, they don't need to be going to the movies. If they're still relying on you to drive them around, they don't need to be dating. And here's why, here's why I say this, is because... If marriage requires a deep friendship, and if dating requires a deep friendship, most of teenagers don't even know how to have a real friendship with the opposite sex. So how can we expect them to date correctly? And I know there's teens in this room, and I can see your eyeballs rolling to the back of your head right now, but I've been doing this for a few years now. I think I know what I'm talking about, and you've seen it, and you probably remember. Think back to your eighth grade homecoming dance that all of you went to. You walk into the gym, and it looks like Moses walked in and split the Red Sea because you got the girls over here and you got the guys over here. They don't know all the time how to have godly friendships, so how can they have a godly marriage that's rooted in friendship. Now I'm about to make a horrible confession to you that I'm not proud of, but I like embarrassing myself for your sake. One of my favorite things to do is watch trash reality TV. I love reality TV. It's like the, 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 the more dramatic, the more catty, the more in, it's like just out of, out of left field, the better for me. And one of my favorite TV shows to watch with my wife is um, The Bachelor and Bachelorette franchise. I love The Bachelor and The Bachelorette. And, and here's the thing. I like to say that shows like these feed the drama in my life because I don't have enough drama. I work with teenagers. I have plenty of drama in my life. Um, but, but I love this show. And I wanted to know when I was writing this sermon, I thought to myself, I was like, I want to know what the stats are on this show. Now, this show has been going on for years and years and years and years. Some of you probably remember like sitting in your college dorm watching it with your roommate. But this show has been going on for a long, long time. And I wanted to know if, if they always say this in The Bachelor and Bachelorette. They always say, you got to trust the process. You got to trust the process. Let's see if the process works. The process of meeting, dating, getting engaged and married in 12 weeks, okay? So I wanted to do some digging. Here's the stats, two of them for you. Only two-thirds of contestants end up with a proposal, okay? That's not bad. Here's the bad one. Only five in the entire franchise history have actually ended with a marriage that actually lasted. Only five. And this show has been around longer than like Walking Dead seasons. And if you know anything about The Walking Dead, those just keep going. Like this show has been around for years and only five worked? There's gotta be something to that. So why doesn't it work? Why doesn't the process work? Well, I think is because in majority, they haven't developed deep roots. They haven't developed deep friendships. So how can you expect that marriage to work out? They just stick it out for two years so they can get to keep the ring. 
Elke and I dated for two years before we even got engaged. And we did life together for two years before we even considered marriage. She saw me at my worst. She saw me at my best. She saw the way I treated my friends. She saw my passions and the things I was interested in. She saw the things I had no interest in. And she also saw my habits, good and bad habits. So takeaway number four for us from Solomon is this. Your relationship should be rooted in friendship. This will lessen the conflict in relationships. It won't take it away, but it will make it a little bit easier. Your spouse should be your best friend. Solomon 6, uh, chapter 6, verses 1 through 3. Now the daughters of Jerusalem are asking the wife these questions. Where has your beloved gone, O most beautiful among women? Where has your beloved turned that we may seek him with you? The wife speaks now. My beloved has gone down to his garden to the beds of spices to graze in the gardens and to gather lilies. I am my beloved and my beloved is mine. He grazes among the lilies. So now the friends for some reason have decided, okay, we're gonna help you. Let's go look for him. And she knows exactly where he is. He is in the garden. And the garden is a symbol for their love. The garden is a symbol for, for their relationship. He's home. He's home waiting for his wife to come back to him. And it shows us that he's not out getting revenge on her. He's not out drinking with his buddies, chasing women because his wife made him angry and he wants to get revenge on her. No, 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 no. He's home. He's at peace. He's waiting for his wife to come home so they can fix this issue. And we see here the offender is chasing the offended. She is looking to repair the relationship between her and her husband. She's seeking to it. She's fighting to save the relationship. So that leads us to takeaway number five which is we should not retaliate during conflict. Retaliation doesn't help anybody. We shouldn't do it, especially when we're in the midst of conflicts. We're going to keep going, verses 4 and four through 6. <clears throat> so she finds her husband. She walks up to her husband. And now this is Solomon speaking about his wife. You are as beautiful as Terza, my love, lovely as Jerusalem, awesome as an army with banners. File that one away for your wife. Awesome as an army of banners. Turn away your eyes from me, for they overwhelm me. Your hair is like a flock of goats leaping down the slopes of Gilead. Your teeth are like a flock of ewes that have come up from the washing. All of them bear twins. Not one among them has lost its young. We see his response to her here. He's, he loves her. He's complimenting her. He's excited about her. He sees how beautiful she is, and he is ready to forgive her. He calls her as awesome as an army of banners. What else do you want from a guy? Like, Husbands, think of the coolest thing for you and then tell your wife you love her more than that. For me, like, you're awesome as, like, the Saints winning a Super Bowl one year. That'd be great. Um, for you, it might be you're awesome as, like, that new pitching wedge I got the other day or whatever you're into. He is so into her. He's comparing her to the greatest thing that he can think of. And what I want you to realize here, though, is that Solomon did nothing wrong. At no point did he sin against his wife. However, he is ready to forgive, and what a beautiful picture of forgiveness he paints for us right here. A beautiful picture of forgiveness that, that parallels the way God looks after us and that God chases us and the way that Jesus loves us. Takeaway number six, our final one is this. Be willing to forgive and move on. You have to move on. Be willing to forgive and not keep score. You don't get to forgive an argument and then file it away so that in two months you get to bring it up again. That's not forgiveness. We cannot keep score. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 12, it says this about um, the nation of Israel and God speaking to them. And it says this, For I will be merciful towards their inequities and I will remember their sins no more. Marriage is beautiful. Marriage is, is, is awesome when it is found in the confines of what God intended for it to be. And you have to fight for it because it is worth fighting for. I promise you that. And in those moments when your husband or your wife is in the perfect, selfless, beautiful, wonderful, mythical unicorn you married all those years ago, you need to remember these passages from Solomon. And you need to remember this. You married a sinner just like you, a sinner that needs grace just like you need it. Don't fight to win the conflict. Fight to save and to win the relationship. That is what we need to be focusing on. Fight for your spouse the way Jesus fought for you. 
Forgive your spouse the way Jesus forgave you. And I want to leave you with this verse from 1 John. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let me pray for us. Lord, I, uh, I just thank you for your word this morning. God, thank you for Solomon and for his wisdom. And Father, as we talk about relationships, whether they're romantic <clears throat> or platonic, <clears throat> God, I pray that you would remind us on how we are to handle conflict. God, that conflict is inevitable, but that there is a right way and a wrong way to do conflict. God, in the moments when we are in the midst of conflict, would you remind us on how you handle conflict with us, that you love us, that you forgive us, and that there is grace to be found. Father, I pray for the relationships in this room, whether uh, marriage relationships or platonic relationships. Would you allow those to grow in you, Father, would you bless those relationships? God, if there is struggle in this room right now, if there's heaviness in the heart in this room, especially about um, a message like this, Father, would you bring comfort? Lord, would you go before us today? Would you go before us to our different circles, Father, and be with us and allow us to be a light for you? Lord, thank you for Jesus. And every day of our lives, Father, I pray that you remind us of who we are and whose we are. And it's in his name I pray, amen.